Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash teacher recharge. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. And guess what, guys? When you go to audibletrial.com slash teacher recharge, you not only support Audible, but you also support this here podcast. So I would really appreciate it. Go to audibletrial.com slash teacher recharge today. My name is Fred Kep. And I am the host of the Teacher Recharge Podcast, and I'd like to give a quick shout out to the Friends University Singing Quakers for welcoming me back with open arms over the past few weeks to perform with them through their candlelight concerts. It was amazing. It was fantastic. Love you guys. Let's get on with the show. Hello to all my happy teachers out there. It is another Monday, the second to last Monday of the semester. We're almost on break. You're almost on break. Keep pushing. You can do this. And we're going to help you get there with another amazing episode today. We have a fantastic guest. I'm a little partial to her because I'm related to her. Her name is Natalie Gray. She is my aunt. And to be honest, before this interview, I honestly did not know she was this impressive. Now, listen up. She went to high school in a place called Van Horn, Texas. That's in rural Texas. And then after college, she taught fifth grade at a private school for three years in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and she noticed some differences. She learned and noticed some different tools and opportunities and resources that were given to people in the urban area and in the private school sector that weren't necessarily given to the public school sector and, and to kids in rural Texas. And that kind of sparked this amazing career in education where she worked with Summerbridge and went to launch two sites in Cincinnati and Fort Worth and led a site in Manchester, New Hampshire for seven years. And then she also down the line worked for Teach for America's human assets team and designed and led ed professional development and served as the vice president for staff learning and development and led a large dispersed team to deliver staff trainings on topics including management, leadership, and diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. She's now working as an independent contractor and has been fortunate to work with several organizations who produce meaningful work that supports their impact on the school environment. She is amazing. This is a great interview. Some fantastic topics come up. I hope you get something out of this. And so without further ado, let's get into it. Here is the interview with Natalie Gray. All right, everyone on the show today, we have someone that is very special, very uh, dear to my heart, my own aunt, Natalie Gray. How are you doing tonight? It is tonight, actually. I am doing well, doing well. Awesome. Well, it is so great to have you. Uh, she's actually in Austin, Texas. Is it, uh, is it freezing there? How cold is it? It's cold. It's yeah. cold. It's in the 40s. We are safe watching movies instead of braving the cold. It is it's cold. cold. It's cold for a, Texa, for a Texan. It's, it's yeah. free. Well, if it's cold there, it's free freezing here. Well, it's great to have you. And to be honest, before we recorded this, I actually didn't know too much about your extensive educational background, which is interesting because for as long as I can remember, we've been related. And uh, <laughs> and so that's just really interesting. I So with that said, though, nobody else listening to this knows anything about it. So could you kind of, in a nutshell, kind of take us through your educational journey. Yeah, sure. So I didn't start out planning on having an educational journey. I didn't plan on teaching. And actually at the University of Texas, I studied speech language pathology, and I have a degree in communication sciences and disorders. But what happened was my last couple of years of college, while I was taking courses in speech pathology, I kept wondering why the methods we used in speech pathology weren't just the way we teach all kids. 
because it was all about individualizing, meeting kids where they were and helping them move in a progression to, to do what they needed to do. And so in my last couple of years, that combined with getting to do a couple of really neat education programs one called the Normandy Scholars Program, where I went to France and studied World War II. And another was the College of Communication Senior Fellows Program, where I got to do cool things like we had nine hours of class time with Walter Cronkite. So (laughs) it was was pretty amazing. Made me realize that I wanted to take what I was learning about great learning and teaching and and so on and go into a career in education. But my 21-year-old self thought the thing to do was to go into ed policy. I had gone to high school in rural West Texas. And when I got to the University of Texas, I recognized immediately that kids from wealthier communities had had a really different educational experience than I had. For instance, I had no idea you could study for the SAT. Um, (laughs) And they all, you know, had taken prep courses. Right. And you start to realize this is just not right, that where you live determines the quality of education you get. So I decided I wanted to do educational policy. I got into Harvard's Graduate School of Education, and it was in those classes that I got kind of humble because my classmates were school superintendents and folks who were really leading in education, not just in America, but around the world. And I realized that you shouldn't do educational policy if you've never taught. And so I decided to teach. I started out as a fifth grade teacher, taught for nine years altogether. And in the course of that, discovered an educational program that's now called Breakthrough that helps young people who would be the first in their families to complete college to to do that. And so I was involved with that for about 17 years in a couple of different cities and then joined Teach for America in 2008 to start teaching adults. And I did staff learning and development, focusing on our executive directors at Teach for America. And then did that till a couple of years ago. And since then, I've been independent contracting, working with lots of different kinds of educational organizations, continuing to teach and learn, but not with kids these days. That's really awesome. And and what I always like to go back to is the the passion that kind of brought that about, you know, being in, in a West Texas. It was... It was Van Horn, yes. Van Horn, Texas. Uh, yeah. I'm not- East of El Paso on <laughs> I-10. I graduated with 42 kids. 42 so- kids. Wow. And I, I feel like a lot of our listeners probably haven't been to that area of the world because, you know, not many people have been to that part of the world. Yeah. Beautiful place. Yeah. Beautiful place. It is beautiful. We lived, actually, it's so rural out there that we lived 70 miles north of our school. Mm -hmm. Um, And so every day was get up in the morning, ride the bus 70 miles. And the bus driver was my mom who had to (laughs) drive the bus. She could work in the school office. (laughs) And then we all came home on the bus and there were all the kids on the ranches in between Van Horn and Guadalupe Mountains National Park. So yeah, it was it was quite a place to go to high school. <laughs> that is crazy. Like that is so different from the average student. But I guess in that area of the world, that might actually be more average than, than usual, which is part of why, from what I understand, that's part of why you got into what you were doing is like the opportunities aren't the same, right? Like I'm, I'm coaching yeah. a bunch of, you know, inner city high school boys and what's interesting about the school I, I went to in high school and the school I'm coaching at now is like, you'll have one guy in the program that is first generation, never, like mm-hmm. nobody in his family even expects him to go to college. He doesn't even know that that's an option yet. Yeah. He, <laughs> this is actually like a true thing. So I had a guy that was Hispanic, first generation. I think he had uh, also a little bit of Native American doesn't think college is an option it's like come on man and has good grades and is good at soccer come on man like these kids need these resources they need to understand that things are possible but then also funding you know funding is a is a lot less for him than it is i mean people in the same program come from a very affluent family you know that that it's not even Uh, an issue they're like oh i'm gonna go to wsu i already know and i don't even have to apply for scholarships because like i don't really need them 
that really is what has shaped my whole career because I went to high school in Van Horn and then I had the opportunity to go to a large state university. So I went to the University of Texas and I had classes at UT that were bigger than my entire high school in Van Horn. And as I said, most of the people I met were from Dallas and Houston and folks from around the country who were from middle and upper class families who had had a really different educational experience than I had. And then I had the opportunity to go from a large state university to an Ivy League school. And so I got to Harvard and saw the difference between an Ivy League school and a large state university. And again, wow, this is really different. (laughs) If you, this had been your undergraduate experience, What would you know? Who would you know that you don't ever know or meet, you know, at a large state university? And then when I wanted to teach, I hadn't gotten into a master's program where I was going to be certified to teach because I wasn't planning to teach. So Mm -hmm. I was looking for an alternative pathway to the classroom. And I found out uh, that most private schools didn't require teaching certificates. So then I ended up going and teaching at a really elite private school in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of imagine the difference between that school (laughs) and Van Horn High School. Oh, right. Yeah, definitely. I I didn't even know schools like that existed. Mm -hmm. And then there I am teaching kids whose families were paying more for fifth grade than I paid for my college degree. (laughs) Um, And it really just so these, these waves of just really deepening my conviction that it's just not right. That where you live and what resources your family has access to determine the quality of education and opportunity you get. And so that has been my whole career is in one way or another, trying to either directly work with students and families who don't have access to resources that more Mm -hmm. affluent kids do or work with organizations that are working on that issue. I always say I... I have this really deep conviction around educational equity, not because I read some books about it, but because of my own journey and sort of living through that. Right. And, and it's just not right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's so awesome, though. Like the, uh, the, the passion that leads into such a cool and, and curvy like career, yeah. you know, like it's just like a winding road, but it's like also based on a backbone. That is really right. strong and that's super respectable. That's super awesome. And honestly, that's why you're the awesome guest that is on the show. All right. <laughs> so with that said, yeah. this podcast is all about passion. It's all about helping teachers start their week off ready to go at it. We want them to be pumped up. We want them to be charged up. We want them to have that passion just pouring out onto mm-hmm. their students. So with that said, the first question I like to ask my guests is, what are you doing to start the week right now? How do you go into your week with a positive mindset and ready to get things done? Yeah. So I had the opportunity when I went to Teach for America, I had been an executive director of a nonprofit and had and was still teaching middle school. So I was teaching seventh and eighth grade. I was running Breakthrough in Manchester, New Hampshire. And I mean, it was just busy, crazy, everything from grading papers and lesson planning to raising money and running board meetings and admitting students and designing curriculum and just very busy. When I then went to Teach for America, my job was to do professional development for executive directors. And so I always say my first couple of years at Teach for America was like being on a paid sabbatical because it was my job to read all these books and learn all this stuff that when you're an executive director, it's really hard to find time to do that. So you know you could do things better, but you don't know how to do it. I got to do a whole unit of study with executive directors around prioritization and time Mm -hmm. management and how to do what matters most and how to manage your energy so you get more out of the time that you put in. So not just managing your time, but managing your energy. And some of the biggest ideas have stuck with me that I still do. So it's starting the week, but also starting the day. Now, not everybody is a morning person, <laughs> but maybe from Van Horn High School and having to get on the bus. I don't yeah. know. I love getting up early, and so I. It's kind of like an hour of power between like five thirty and six thirty, or five and six, depending on the day. And I use that to 
organize around what really does matter most, like what has to happen today, because so many things come at us and there's so many things on our to-do list that actually don't matter a lot. Right. And sometimes we spend our time on those things because we like them more (laughs) or they're easier. We can check them all off. So really getting centered on like what matters most today, what matters most this week, so that when things come at you out of the blue, you can deal with them without losing sight of, no, no, this thing really needs time. So that's what I would say is kind of taking the time in that quiet part of the day to really center on what has to be done. Sometimes also get it done. Like sometimes you can get your most important thing done before 630 in the morning and it's awesome. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Um, And the rest gravy after that but amen something that i don't think i mentioned in in the beginning of the episode because you said a quiet part of the day uh you're a mom you're a mom too you fit in the time to do that as well so a quiet part of the day probably doesn't happen a crazy amount obviously you have your professional things that you you need to get taken care of how how do you manage your schedule then because you you also talked about knowing how to to prioritize and stuff so i am a mom as you know of three daughters. Beautiful daughters. Ninth, thank you. Beautiful, <laughs> talented. <laughs> the whole nine Hard work. Yeah. Uh, One's a ninth grader, one is a sixth grader, and one is a fourth grader. And so what that means for the first time since we've had kids is we have three different schools oh, and wow. all the girls are athletes. So today we were at two basketball games. Alice is about to start soccer season and track season. Oh, wow. Yeah. And they're all interested in leadership. So they're very busy, right. which makes us very busy. And so I think that morning hour is especially important to me because mm-hmm. to your point, like there is no other quiet hour. Right. Like there just isn't. I'm either, you know, with a client or on a call or running a training or trying to meet a deadline before it's time to pick people up after school and get to ballet or basketball or whatever. So I, I'm a big believer to speaking, if there are any other mothers out there, or fathers out there listening in, you know, this idea of like this magical balance, it's just not real life. It's, right. this is just hard. Um, there's a lot to juggle every week and sometimes you drop the ball either on the professional side or the personal side and I think the key is probably as much as you can being kind to yourself like one of my daughters plays flag football and is quarterback Mm -hmm. a lot she plays quarterback a lot and what happens when you play quarterback a lot is you throw interceptions mm-hmm. and that's just part of it. So you can't get down on yourself when you throw an interception because it's going to be a quarterback you're going to throw interceptions. And I think that's sort of like the parenting thing. If you're going to be a parent, you're going to mess up. So <laughs> if you aren't ready to forgive yourself for that and, and move on with things, it might not be the thing for you. Right. <laughs> um, it's that, hard and messy and busy. That, that is like such a good little snippet of advice though like and and I feel like that's that goes for so much more than just parenting I mean just teaching in general I've had it's it, it is unbelievable this is the 17th episode and the amount of teachers that have named their first year like the story time oh i remember mm-hmm. when my my fr- i have a question that we'll probably get to here in a bit uh where it's like what is something that you failed at and how how did mm-hmm. you react the amount of teachers i would probably i mean i i don't know right off the top of my head i don't know but i feel like a good majority of the teachers always when i ask that question they go i remember the first year <laughs> of me yeah. teaching they start with that and it's just one of those things that I just feel with teaching, with coaching, like I do, or, or with parenting, yeah. with, with anything, like you're going to mess up. And that's such an important yeah. thing to be okay with is, is like, look, I'm human. I'm human. I make yeah. mistakes. We make mistakes. But then also yeah. knowing that other people are human too, because that's yeah. something I feel like I've been trying to work on personally as well is like, okay, well, I wouldn't drop the ball there. Well, would you? I don't know. Like, hold your judgment because I, I dropped the ball quite a bit. And then other people, like, I don't know. Other people are going to drop the ball too. How do you react? And that's really the big thing. It's human to make yeah. mistakes. That's okay. I'm okay with it. Now, how can I learn from it? I have said to my daughters more than once, look, you guys, I'm doing the best that I can. Mm-hmm. It's just not always that good. Yeah. Like, but I'm doing my best. 
like I'm, I'm giving it my all and sometimes it just falls short. So I think there's that like mutual understanding. And then as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, whether it's family, raising a family or teaching or coaching, the other thing that I think is so powerful is, is having that understanding, you know, like I'm just another person. (laughs) I'm not going to do something magical just because I'm called mom or teacher or coach. Like I'm just another human being, but also cultivating that real sense of community and mutual support and mutual obligation so that, you know, sometimes in our family, we talk about, look, we got to do the family team thing. Like one person can't carry this whole thing. Like we all got to be there for each other. And, and in a classroom back when I first started teaching, especially I was young. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would say to the students, look, we are all in this learning together. (laughs) Uh, We're just learners I'm no better or worse than you I'm just a little bit ahead of you in age and together we can learn a whole lot this year yeah and I think that he really rises to that versus you imagining yourself that you're this big expert and then yeah. everybody comes like you gotta you know you're the vice president of this team you got to make this happen you just try to create that sense of humanity and collective support and impact and uh, one, one thing I, I tell my my soccer players I always, with all three teams that I coach, actually, I've said this, including the high school boys. I said, look, guys, look, I'm 24 and I'm a head coach of a high school team. Like who in their right mind hired me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I tell, yeah. them, right? I, I tell them, I tell them, here's the deal. We're going to make a deal here. Okay. Cause I'm going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Here's the thing. I make you better. You make me better deal. And they're like, yeah, sure. And it's like, okay, cool. Let's do it then. Like we're here to make, like we make mistakes. It's all good. Yeah. You call me out yeah. on my bull crap. I'll call you out on your bull crap. Yeah. Everybody gets better. It's all good. Right. And that actually yeah. kind of answers that question from you actually for, uh, with the, what is something you failed at and how mm. did you react? So, so that's awesome. Two and one, why not? So with that said, I think it is actually about time for the break. So we're going to go ahead and take a really quick break. Thank a sponsor and we will be back with some story time. For you, the listeners of the Teacher Recharge podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. Now, whenever I have a guest on the show, I ask them for a recommendation. So Natalie, what is your recommendation? Yeah, I'm thinking about all the teachers out there and thinking if you've never read the classic, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race by Dr. Beverly Tatum, you should. It is a great frame and way to think about race and racism in school. Well, if you would like a copy of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race or any of the other 180,000 titles that they have to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, you can just go to www.audibletrial.com slash teacher recharge. Once again, that is www.audibletrial.com slash teacher recharge today. And we are back. We are back on the interview with Natalie Gray. Hey, guess what time it is? It's my favorite time of the week, possibly of the entire year, possibly of my entire life. It is story time. Boom. This is the part of the show where I give my guest the floor to tell me the best story that they can possibly think of, the most impactful, the most comedic, whatever they want. The ball's in their court. So Natalie, what is your favorite story? Well, when you teach for a long time, you have a million stories. And I can literally picture kids' faces and moments in fifth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade. But the teaching experience and sort of big story that affects lots of those kids was the opportunity that I had with another teacher to 
learn from a teacher, Dr. Stephen Feinberg in Massachusetts, who had developed a course on the history of social justice in America. And we were using his content and adapting it for eighth graders, because eighth graders are at a time where they have a really acute sense of right and wrong and fairness. And so when you get into concepts of social justice, they are eager to learn. And so it was the coolest course where it started out looking at the foundations of justice in America. So all those foundational documents that set up our nation and then sort of went through several units that told the rest of the story. So then we went from foundations of justice to justice delayed and looked at the African-American experience. And we were able to match up that experience to those foundations and talk about where the gaps were and why. And then we were able to look at the women's, women's experience in the United States. And my colleague used to always want to call that unit justice skirted, <laughs> but I wouldn't let him do justice skirted, <laughs> but it was just this terrific unit about women working to get the right to vote in our country and full citizenship and right to education and own property and all of those things. And then a unit called Justice Denied, which looked at the Native American experience. And what was amazing for me was I had a master's degree and in designing and researching and developing the curriculum for the course, I was learning stuff that I had never learned that no one had ever taught me in any classroom setting ever. So I was learning a ton. And then I was able to share that with, I think, four years of eighth graders who also, and you know, they were younger than me, but they also had not learned any of this part of history. And I think for all of us who got to teach and learn in that class together, the impact was really lasting. I mean, those kids are adults now, and every now and then one pops up on Facebook or whatever and talks about the impact that that course had on them and what they chose to study in college or what they now do professionally, because there is a whole richness to American history and the story we tell is so small and really doesn't include most Americans. And so that was a really, really powerful teaching experience and a, a wonderful thing to get to do, learning and teaching at the same time. Wow. That is such a unique opportunity as well. And what we were talking about before before story time, what we were talking about was like, oh, if it if it stands out, like that's probably the the story you should tell on story time, just because the amount of impact that that seemed to have not only on you, but on other people is just, that's big. You know, that's like why we do things like this, you know, and, and for everyone listening out there, like that kind of impact, that kind of thing, that's the kind of impact you have on your students and stuff. That's the kind of impact you yourself can even be available for, for your, for your own life to have an impact on your life, which is cool. Cause I think, I think sometimes, especially on this podcast, like we kind of get caught up with like, Oh, like I want to impact my students. For example, I, I say it a lot in, in the introduction a lot is like, this is another week that you can go out and have a big impact on your students. And that's true. That's really true. But also like allow yourself to be impacted as well. Allow yourself to learn things, allow yourself to, to look at things and keep learning and keep learning because just being open to that is so big. Everybody's learning. Kind of like we talked about earlier in the episode, like you, you help me get better. I get, I help you get better. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Amazing. Yep. I, the best teachers are often the most avid learners. Right. The more you love learning, the more you're going to help other people love learning. And so it just feeds on itself. All right. That is fantastic. Well, I think we are about out of time. So if people want to get in contact with you, how can they do that? How can they reach you? Yeah. You know, I'm findable probably best on LinkedIn. You can type in Natalie Gray and I should pop up when you do that. Natalie Gray in Austin, Texas. And I always love hearing from teachers and, and supporting folks as they're moving along in their professional journey. So it'd be fun to hear from folks. Okay. Awesome. Sweet. Well, we will definitely put a link to that in the description. And if you or someone you know would be good for this podcast, go ahead, email me at teacherrechargepodcast at gmail.com. Once again, that is teacherrechargepodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you want to learn a little more about what I speak about when I go to schools, you can go to fredmotivates.com and learn about the love and success approach to leadership. I would love to serve you and your students. And you know what? Natalie, thank you so much for coming this week. It means a lot. It's so awesome to have a family member on an interview and one that is quite admittedly so impressive and, and such an amazing person. Nonetheless, I mean, it's just 
it's it's been a great interview. I appreciate it so much. You bet. Thanks for inviting me. 